Okay, so well, welcome folks uh, to the latest uh, session of the Applied Category Theory Discussion Group. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting day where we'll be taking on this uh, third pillar of, uh, of category theory um, with an eye towards, um, towards understanding its implications for applied category theory. The third pillar, of course, um, uh, builds on uh, the ones we've already covered, the, the two earlier pillars, uh, categories and functors, the structure preserving mappings between categories. Uh, and today we'll be, be talking about natural transformations, which you can see uh, as structure preserving mappings between functors. Uh, this emphasis uh, stays true to the, uh, to the general weight that category theory places uh, not just on, on pieces, but on, on connections between the pieces um, uh, with a, a centrality of understanding interconnections um, uh, that, that lies throughout category theory. And uh, natural transformations um, provide another example of this um, where, we, uh, where we use them to to reason about the relationship between the connections between uh, one functor and another. Um, I did ask you to review uh, three uh, videos uh, prior to this session, and <clears throat> we'll be drawing on uh, some intuitions that were uh, foundationally put into place by those videos. <clears throat> but um, I'm going to uh, try to use this session uh, to weave together themes that that uh, are otherwise uh, captured in, in fragmented way across those videos, um, but also to, to hammer home some of the um, the direct relevance of this to um, to programming and functional programming in particular, um, with a set of examples, not not just relying on on one, um, to which we made use uh, last time, um, the example of Safehead but really going through a set of them that I, I hope will be collectively enough to kind of um, give you a feel for um, the role that, that natural plant transformations play um, uh, and, and how, it, how it generalizes to a wide number of cases. Um, within today's session, um, we're going to be uh, making use of a variety of diagrams um, that that also build on and sort of adapt or inspire are inspired by those in some of those videos, but which I hope will will illustrate in greater detail some of what's going on and explicate it further than some of those videos um, uh, were able to do um, in terms of understanding its implications. Um, Okay, so uh, in order to do that, uh, I'm going to need to switch to, um, to presentation mode. Um, but I'm also going to be using this session to kind of um, uh, offer, uh, hopefully some, probably towards the end, if, if we have time for it, some neat interactive drawing with this, uh, with this drawing tablet, this graphics tablet, which I've used, which I, I, uh, I have reason to believe will really bring out the um, the, the colors um, and um, and the distinctions better than as possible um, on the uh, the blackboard. Um, so we may make some use of the blackboard, but um, the ability to do so is hampered by the fact that uh, one of my machines is down with motherboard uh, problems, and I'm going to have to uh, take a few weeks to uh, to get a new fan in and repair it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to switch over to uh, screen uh, sharing here. Can you folks uh, see my screen? Yep. Uh, I can. Okay. Yep. That's great. My condolences. Um, uh, okay. So uh, as I noted, uh, the, the focus here is on natural transformations. And um, probably the most central of the videos, uh, which I did ask you to review, was one by Bartosz Miliuski, um, where uh, I thought he quite skillfully introduced um, the basic concepts of natural transformation and gave motivations uh, for, for how they fit in with category theory and their relevance to uh, functional programming. Um, 
And I, I want to go back to this diagram um, because uh, it is foundational and it will provide uh, the basis for many elaborations of this diagram um, that, that will illustrate uh, particular applications of this process uh, with, with different, um, uh, different functors, um, different pairs of functors. So again, natural transformation is all about um, uh, structure preserving mappings between functors. Um, it wasn't too long, long ago from this floor and indeed from this seat on my side that uh, we introduced the notion of, of functor. And, and I'm emphasizing that by way of sort of uh, comparison for why we're talking about structure preserving mappings for between functors. Um, it, it, it bears keeping in mind functors as structure preserving mappings between categories. And indeed a, a given functor as shown in this diagram, say F or, 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 or G will map objects in one category to objects in another morphisms in one category, such as F over here on the left, to morphisms in another. Um, but it doesn't just do so in a willy-nilly way and sort of splatting them down. Um, it does so in a way that uh, is, is consistent um, with, with the structure of the, uh, of the categories being captured and uh, particularly preserves in the mapping the structure of uh, category C, its source category, um, in in its uh, in its uh, placement of of the images in in D, um, and in particular, you may remember some conditions uh, for it to be a legitimate functor, or uh, uh, to be regarded as preserving structure in a first order way. Um, it needs to map identity, uh, identity morphisms to identity morphisms. Uh, it needs to map uh, morphisms between any two objects uh, to the to, to be a morphism in, in the other category between the mappings of those objects. So F goes between A and B and C. A maps to F A, B maps to F B. And so F from C has to map into something between FA and FB, which in this case is FF. Um, but there was something more as well, right? It, it had to preserve composition uh, of two morphisms in C. And I don't have that shown uh, on this diagram, but basically if you had two morphisms end to end in C, F and G, um, where uh, F say goes from A to B and G from B to C, um, we, we would map them into a morphism in D. There wasn't just any old morphism. Um, no, it was a morphism from um, F of A to F of C. But more than that, uh, it, it needed to preserve that composition. So if we, considered, um, uh, if we considered what particular morphism it was, it needed to be the, the same morphism as would come in D from composing F of F with, so doing the composition over in D between F of F and F of, D, F of G. Those two have to compose to F of the composition of F and G um, as, as mapped from C. So there was this, this structural uh, relationship between C and D that needed to be preserved, um, uh, captured, conserved by by the functor. So, so functors were the structure preserving mappings between categories. They live by other rules so that they'll be well behaved. And it's the same thing with natural transformations between functors in many ways. They have to be well, they have to be well behaved. They have to uh, preserve the structure of the functors. Um, between any pair of categories, there's not strictly always a functor. Um, uh, for example, if the, the target category is the empty category, there's not going to be a functor between them. Um, but functors in general can, you know, collapse objects and, and so on. There's a lot of latitude there. Natural transformations between two functors are fairly specific things. Um, if, if we consider a functor F and a functor G, both have to go between C and D 
same source, same target category. It's very important. Um, and uh, it may or may not be that there's a, a mapping between them, um, a systematic way in which F, the actions of F in D can be related to the actions of G in D. Uh, for example, um, what we're looking for here is mappings that make use of morphisms in D. So uh, this mapping alpha A is, is something that relates A as it's mapped to by F to A as it's mapped to by G, by functor G. Um, and uh, some, in some categories, that mapping will be, the, the potential for that mapping will be absent. There, there's no such, there's no morphism going from FA to FG, given how F and, and G are defined. They, they map A to different solitudes uh, where there's no mapping. If D is a discrete category with no morphisms between two different objects, we're not gonna be able to, to, to say that there's this systematic mapping from, from how F maps objects to how G maps objects. Because um, there's, there's no mappings there. There's no morphisms in D going between those. Um, if, if F and, and, and G are mapping A to different objects. Um, so so uh, bear in mind, uh, natural transformations aren't a given. And in fact, um, the existence of a natural transformation between functor F and G and it is a directional thing. It's a question, can we, can we um, map F into G in a way that's natural? Um, it has a certain directionality applied to it. Um, uh, that, that implies that in some sense, uh, G is similar to F. It, it has a similar action that it performs, but it may not be the same thing. It may not be isomorphic, there are fascinating cases of natural isomorphisms, but it, it, it may collapse things, for example. Uh, uh, G may sponge a bunch of things together that are otherwise mapped to by different objects and, 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 and mapped to different objects and, and, and F. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, for example, um, a given morphism F might map uh, A, B, C, D, E here over into uh, into objects here in this kind of, we could think of it as kind of where F maps at this upper plane that are all distinct. Whereas G um, uh, has a somewhat cruder rendition. It collapses D and E into the same object in, um, in its embedding as it were of the source category and the target category. If we refer to those again as C and, uh, and D source and target respectively, it may scrunch together uh, D and E, but it has to do it in a way that's consistent for there to be a natural transformation between them. And if we, if we look here, the natural transformations are seen as kind of these, these morphisms, these arrows that go between the planes. Um, this again, being inspired by uh, Bartosz Milewski's um, uh, diagrams, which, which make use of that metaphor. So here, the two functors F and G are embedding the source category C over in the target category. They're doing so in different places, but there's a relationship between them captured by that natural, those natural, that natural transformation. And the components of the natural transformation are shown as these kind of little strands extending down between those planes. Each such component, um, uh, says where it, it relates, it, it indicates, okay, the component comes from where F brought it, brought an object to where G brought the same object. So we label them, those, those components of the natural transformation, these alphas, by the name of the object that whose position they're relating um, from F to G. So in this case, it's A, or over here on the right, B. Okay, um, and uh, and you can think of it at a certain level. Uh, this natural transformation is mapping objects, therefore, to morphisms. Right, A gets mapped into this morphism alpha A. B gets mapped into this morphism alpha B. 
alpha A goes from how A, F maps A to how G maps A, and alpha B goes from how F maps B to how G maps B. Mm. Uh, but a natural transformation does more than that. It, it maps morphisms into these naturality square shown here and right in this parallelogram, okay? Um, this twisted square. Um, so, so here F is, is not just mapped to one morphism, it's, it's mapped to this whole twisted square on the right. Um, so uh, in that twisted square for it to be natural has to commute, meaning that if we consider any two ways from getting from FA up here in the upper left to GB down here in the lower right, um, we have to get the same function um, either way. So if we compose FF going along this upper part with alpha B down the, the, the right, we have to have the same function in D, the exact same mapping from FA to, to GB has to be induced as if we had gone instead alpha A first and then GF second, okay? Um, and for those who were with us last time, you know, we used the example of, of safe head, right? Safe head here is the polymorphic function. It's a, it's a function parameterized by type. So you can think of it as subscripted by the type. That's the alpha here. Um, its job in life is to translate a list of whatever, say int, into a maybe a, that same whatever int. Um, so it goes, uh, each object here represents a type. And in that polymorphic function maps um, here list of int into, um, into maybe a bit. F might be something that maps ints to bools, like is negative. And, and uh, and it's going to, and so uh, the the mapping alpha b here would be so f b would be like a list of bool. We could we could lift that function is negative to operate on lists of ints, and it'll produce a list of bools. Or we could do so on a list of maybes, and it'll produce uh, uh, excuse me a maybe of of ints, and it'll produce a maybe of bools. And alpha B therefore maps a list of bools to a, a, a maybe of bools. Um, so that was our sort of example from programming. We have lots of those. Um, and so there's this naturality square to which a given morphism in C is mapped. And that naturality square has to be, has to commute for this to be a legitimate natural transformation, just as for something to be a legitimate functor it had to preserve composition. If the functor is F, F of, uh, call, call the functor capital F, capital F of, of the composition of, of any two morphisms, lowercase f and lowercase g and c has to, has to equal um, over in D, the, the composition of uh, F, capital F of lowercase f um, composed with uh, capital F of g. Um, that was the criteria to be a functor. Here we have a criteria to be a natural transformation. Um, we have to we have to have these naturality squares commute um, in order for it to be a natural transformation. And I want to emphasize something that I didn't emphasize enough last time. And then I think some of the the commentators could do well to to better emphasize. To wit, um, this has to hold this naturality square. Um, will be produced for every function over here in C. So if, if we have another morph function, sorry, I lapse. Um, not all morphisms are functions. Remember, some morphisms can be relations. A is less than or equal to B. Other morphisms can be, uh, can be one thing factors another. So, but if there's multiple morphisms over in C, say not only F, but G, we're going to have a naturality square for each of them, right? So G is gonna be mapped by F, by functor F over into, into this morphism between, as is the rule for a functor, FA and FB. And 
G is going to be mapped by functor capital G into this morphism between GA and GB. Mm -hmm. And that induces another naturality square going FA, FG to FB, going along the top curvy part of this right, um, this right diagram, and then down via alpha B has to yield the same exact function to going from FA through alpha A down to GA, and then that curvy part of the lower transect uh, GG over to GB. Um, those have to be, that has to commute as well. So it's not just that, you know, we have this naturality condition for one F, we have to do it for all the morphisms over here in C, because after all, all of them have to be mapped into D. And all of them, each and every one is responsible for producing something um, that's a naturality square that commutes. In short, this is a pretty strong condition uh, if there's lots of morphisms over here in C, it gives us lots of choices for what alpha A could be and alpha B going between, you know, FA and GA or going between FB to GB. But we also have lots of naturality squares. We have to make sure it commute. Um, we have to, you know, there there needs to be uh, uh, this this uh, conservation of their action in F and G. And what do these naturality squares really tell us? Well, it it tells us that, look, F, the functor capital F and the functor capital G act in similar ways on, on C. They're, they're in some sense compatible. They're in some sense um, uh, uh, consistent with each other. Um, they may not be the same. G may be coarser than F, for example, may collapse multiple things into one thing. But in each their own way, they preserve the semantics of, um, of F in a similar way of, of lowercase f when it's, when it's mapped over. Um, they, they yield a, a consistent mapping, okay? Um, so we have to remember this holds for all functions F, okay? Um, that we have these naturality squares. And that's a strong condition. Um, naturality is, is not something that um, is to be assumed uh, between any two functors, far from it. Um, not only may it not occur because they may map into different solitudes, different connected components in D, but it may not happen because their actions are just not compatible with one another. Um, they're not consistent. They, they do totally different things. But there are a lot of cases where it, it does hold and, and we'll be, be seeing, seeing those. And those are beautiful cases. So Bartosz, in one of the uh, analogies that I gave last time, um, talked about, um, reminded us that functors are, can be viewed as kind of finding patterns from the source category C, shown here on the left, to the target category D, shown here on the right. And in this view, the action of a functor um, over here in, um, um, it, it, in mapping this kind of pattern from uh, these objects and morphisms from C um, will we'll map it into some place in D where it finds a similar pattern. So here we have sort of something that can map to some anthropomorphic head over here and into a hand uh, uh, over here. And not only do the objects have to be mapped to objects um, shown in the yellow arrows, but we have to map the paths between them to, uh, to valid paths here. So the neck path has to go to a, a, a neck path here over here on the right and the path from the, the torso to the hand has to be mapped over here. And uh, a different functor G might, might find Another instance of that pattern, which is a bit different, um, it looks like a not only a, a canine but a, a mad canine, a canine afflicted with um, with rabies, um, and so there's a head, and there's a uh, a paw here, and uh, once again the functor needs to 
to, to map each of the objects to the objects in the path uh, to the path. Um, uh, Wade, for example, is very familiar with the path uh, to the paw. Um, and um, uh, here we, um, we have two versions of this original pattern over here in C being found uh, in D. And a natural transformation would relate those two. It would say the head goes to the head. The head in the human is given, you know, uh, can be directly corresponds to the head down here in the, the mad dog. The, um, the hand in the human maps to the paw. Um, and, uh, and it would also map uh, the morphisms um, uh, up here. Um, to uh, to their uh, to their according um, to their according naturality squares for it to to commute legitimately. So here again, the head is associated with a mapping that says, "How do I go from the head as found in the human to the head as found in the dog? How do I go from the paw as found or the appendage found in the human to the appendage found in the in the dog?" Um, and each morphism would be mapped to a naturality square that, that guaranteed a consistency. Um, okay, so that was naturality at a, at a sort of abstract level, but that's, that's probably troublingly abstract for most people. And I'd like to spend the vast bulk of our time together, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, going through a set of particular examples, many of which I asked you um, to undertake as exercises for this session. Forgive me for scarfing down food um, and for bearing my maw much as the, um, the mad dog did there. Maybe, maybe he's just hungry as well. Um, okay, so um, uh, I, you know, I, I thought um, going through these examples uh, because they'll be drawn from uh, from uh, programming, we would do well to emphasize um, this other intuition that Bartosz uh, uh, has has laid out on many occasions, but but one of them in the video um, that I asked you to watch. Um, so. It's this notion that, look, um, natural transformations in some sense are orthogonal to functors. I mean, you can almost see it visually here, right? We have a, a functor mapping over uh, A to FA, and then the natural transformation is almost orthogonal. But I'm not talking geometrically. I'm talking conceptually. Um, uh, so uh, in programming, we don't to do too big a disservice. It's, it's a... You know, it's, it's often a reasonable approximation to say, look, we could think of functors um, usefully as being containers, okay? Um, it stretches it a bit, but if you start to broaden your notion of container um, to include things that are, can be produced, for example, it starts to become more plausible. It doesn't work so well with, um, with uh, some continuation continuations monad and so on, but it's, it's a useful intuition. Um, and if we think about functors as containers, uh, we might think about one functor as a crate and another functor as a barrel or another functor as a, as a big uh, bag. And um, we could think of a, uh, a natural transformation here as Re repackaging from one of those containers to another. So we might dump the crate into the barrel, for example, of apples. We don't, we don't touch the apples, but they, they go into the, uh, the crate, they go from the crate uh, to the, um, um, to the barrel. Sometimes not all the apples will fit. And so we might have a list of ints, for example, that gets repackaged into a maybe event. Um, and uh, in, in the form of say pad, and all it takes is the first element of it. And so we just take one um, uh, if it exists, but, uh, but there's a repackaging going on. That element is not changed when we extract it. 
by contrast, um, uh, lifting a function with a functor, going and and lifting, say f with the functor f, lifting is negative, for example, to operate on lists of ints um, will produce a list of bools. Um, that actually doesn't change the packaging. We still have a list on both sides. F, F is list, um, FA is list of ints, FB is list of bools. Um, lifting is negative there, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, change that we're dealing with a list. It doesn't change we're dealing with a barrel or a crate. Um, but what it does do is change the contents, in this case, from, a, from an int to a bool. And so it kind of maps each of the contents. Um, so there, we're not changing the container, but rather we're you know, peeling each of the apples that are in the barrel uh, and leaving them in a barrel. Um, so there are these two orthogonal things. We could change containers with uh, natural transformations, um, going from list to maybe or list to tree, for example, um, uh, going from maybe to list. Um, or we can, we can by lifting functions uh, with a given functor, we can change um, the contents. So now let's, um, uh, so, so this is actually an example of that, uh, that I just, just spoke, spoke through here. So we have safe head and, um, you know, we have these two functors list of maybe, and this fits into our diagram in, in this way. So list of ints, list of bools, this is F mapping, this is lifting is negative to operate on lists, changing each element, but not changing it from being not changing the nature of the container. We still have a barrel called a list. Um, uh, and the same thing goes on at the bottom of this diagram where we're dealing with a different type of container. Instead of dealing with a barrel, we're dealing with a crate. Um, so we have a, a maybe functor. Um, it's a small crate, okay? Um, it, maybe it's like the, the little wrappers they have on, on some fruit. Um, can, can take one fruit. And uh, here we... Um, we're not changing what that is, but we're we're changing it from a, an int to a bool. But uh, the natural transformation here is going from list to maybe. That's the safe head, and and that's repackaging from the barrel to the little fruit thingy, the little fruit, you know, uh, uh, dent preventer or or bruise preventer would be a better better name for it. Um, so that's safe head of int as applied to ints or safe head as applied to bulls. And naturality here said that either way you go around this thing, if you start with the list of ints and you want to get to a, may uh, a, a maybe of bulls through is negative, you can either go first F mapping is negative on the list, going through every single item on that list and uh, mapping it over to bulls. Is it negative? Is it negative? Is it negative? And you get a list of bulls out. And then you just take the first one, the safe head, if there is one, if there is. And if there isn't, it's nothing. Alternatively, um, you should be able to just extract uh, that first one immediately with safe head. You get an int uh, if it exists, uh, if the list is not empty. And, um, and then uh, having got that maybe event, you could lift is negative on that maybe event and get a maybe a bool. And that way saves much more work, right? It, it saves a lot of work if that list were long and we're not in a lazy language, but, um, uh, but it yields the same thing. It has to yield the same thing as long as safe head in, in Haskell is defined with parametric polymorphism. It's, defined by a single rule that applies to all types. Um, so, so here, this actually points to a really nice optimization that's provably correct uh, for parametric polymorphism. Those two, the, either way you go about it, it has to yield the exact same function, precisely the same mapping from list events to maybe a pools. And that's the naturality condition. But again, that has to hold for each and every function. 
G, H, I, etc. over here in C that gets mapped. So it's a very special thing. Um, but fortunately, within the Haskell world, through um, the theorems for free paper, we, we know that things that are par use parametric polymorphism uh, indeed can guarantee this, um, can guarantee naturality. Um, OK, um, now I asked you to, to consider a few other natural transformations and potential natural transformations. One of them is maybe to list. Um, so this um, took a maybe. And if the maybe is nothing, it creates an empty list. So it takes, I should say, I stand corrected. It takes a maybe of a given type, right? It, it takes a maybe, say, of int and, and creates a list of int. Um, so this is a natural transformation between them. Um, that's this thing, maybe, maybe um, to list. Um, takes a maybe and creates a list. Um, and if the maybe is nothing, there's nothing in it. Um, remember, it's a maybe, so there might not be anything in it. We create an empty list event. If the maybe has something in it, we just create a singleton list of that single thing. Um, and we're changing containers here. We're going from the crate to the barrel. We're not changing the item in it. The int that was in the maybe, if there were one, um, it's the int that is exactly placed in the singleton um, that, that results. OK. Um, and yet, um, we could, for example, lift a function is negative here. Um, we start with a maybe event, and we're asking how can we get down to a list of bools? That's the that's reasoning about this naturality square. We'll reason about it for a single function f, but you can imagine it applying to other functions. Um, so single function f is is negative. That would map a maybe event to maybe a bool. Um, just we're asking if it's if it's negative, um, uh, true or false, <clears throat> and then. We could take the maybe maybe the list of that, and either get a nothing or a singleton list. Alternatively, we should we could just as well apply maybe the list on an int, and then lift is negative um, to operate on that. And again, what this is saying is that look, the lifting. It's it's important to note. I, I should have noted this earlier. Um, so I stand remiss, or in this case, I, I sit remiss. Um, so here, remember when I talked about multiple, this has to handle for all, for all functions f, for every function in C, it has to, it has to uh, hold that these naturality squares commute. And I, I want to emphasize here a key point, which again, I think could have been brought out more forcibly by, by uh, the videos. For all these different functions, f, g, h, i, j, and so on, um, we have the same alpha a. We have the same alpha b. It's the same function. That function alpha a is, is parameterized by, by the, um, the source here, right? It's parameterized by, by a over in c. It's, it's got to be the same function. That's a pretty strong condition. The same function alpha a. And alpha b here have to serve for all of these possible functions um, from a to b over here in c. That's, that tells you something, right? There's some structural regularity being captured. Um, and in particular, what it's telling you is that, and maybe I'll illustrate with this particular case, that how list lifts things lifts functions, the rules by which list lives, how it lifts these functions, um, like is negative to operate on things, is in some sense consistent with, in some sense jibes with, how maybe lifts things, um, lifts functions. They're not, you know, defining F map in some sort of totally discombobulated ad hoc um, willy-nilly way. They're, 
they're they're defining in a way that's consistent and and so maybe it may not be a list uh but it's um it behaves in ways that are that that are um consistent with with lists and when you map a function over it on a maybe um it yields something that's somehow structurally consistent with how lifting that same function um over and lists operates and so you're guaranteed no matter what function this could be as negative it could be as positive it could be as perfect square it could be you know as prime or what whatever um um, and we'd still be dealing with ints and bools. Uh, but because list and maybe have this fundamental kind of similarity in, in, in how they lift things and their F map um, that defines them as a functor, um, you get this nice natural transformation between them that holds indeed for all of these different functions. Um, and that tells you something, you know, deep about um, uh, about this um, uh, about the nature uh, of the relationship between list and 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 maybe. Um, and it's a similar thing going the other direction, right? List to maybe and maybe to list in this case. It's it's uh, it's quite nice. They they play nicely. Um, they play in consistent ways. Um, the the ways in which they operate. Are in some sense similar. Are they the same? No, no, they're not the same thing. Um, but they they play nicely. Okay, another thing I asked you to look at was is nothing. Um, so is nothing is an interesting one. And and I noted that basically, and and the notation here is is awkward. Um, uh, but basically, uh, this is something which is mapping from a an obvious container to something we don't really think of as a as a container intuitively. Um, but I'm asking you to humor me because it's kind of um, a container taken to its extreme. It's just a just a bull. It's just bull. It's it's always bull. Um, and we denote that with the delta sub bull within category theory. Um, it's the constant functor. Now, the constant functor is defined in a very particular way. It'll probably come up in another example later, as Tom allows. Um, constant functor is a functor that ignores, um, well, OK, I won't get, get into that. You could say it ignores its type argument. But it maps to a very particular type, which is indicated here as bool. I wrote it as an argument, but I shouldn't should put it as a subscript. Now, um, remember, a functor maps um, objects to objects, and it maps morphisms to morphisms. Um, so, yeah, question? Is there a question? Did someone say something? No? I, thought I don't I, think so. OK, OK, I thought I, I heard a plaintive voice. Um, uh, OK. Um, thank you. So, so remember a constant functor, um, or sorry, a, a, a functor in general maps uh, objects to objects, objects to objects, and morphisms to morphisms. F is mapped to a, to a morphism, right? Um, sorry, to this morphism here, um, in this case. Um, it's, it's how it, it's the morphism that results from it lifting that thing, um, that, that original morphism. Now, um, uh, when we have a constant functor, it maps all objects, A, B, C, whatever, over here from C, into a single object in D. And it maps all morphisms from, you know, A to B, let's say, into, well, where did A go? It went to one object. Where did B go? It went to the same object. So it's got to go from that object to itself. And there can be many morphisms from all objects to itself, but the, the constant functor is actually defined. They all go to the identity morphism for that object. They all go to identity, okay? So remember, identity is special with respect to composition and so on. Um, so here it goes to uh, the identity morphism. Um, so this is what we get in this case. 
So we're going, the natural transformation is a transformation between two functors that relates them. Um, here we have maybe going to the constant functor. So we get something that looks like this. This is a constant functor down here on the bottom. This is the maybe familiar maybe functor up here at the top. Um, and the natural transformation here is nothing. Um, the putative one um, maps from, from one of those functors to another. So a given component of it tells us, just like alpha A told us how A was translated by F versus how it was translated by G, or just like the natural transformation for, for the, this, this dog told us for, for how to go from the head in one to the head in the other. Um, here, this is telling us uh, how ints are handled here in the, in the uh, maybe functor versus how they're handled in the constant functor. So there's a morphism that goes from maybe int to bool. Bool is what the constant functor maps everything to. The constant functor for bool maps everything there. Um, and not surprisingly, maybe a, uh, for, for, for um, maybe a bool. Well, so both int and bool are, 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 um, are ma mapped over here into bool in the constant functor. And so there's a, a, a morphism here that says how bools are mapped by the maybe functor to how they're mapped by the constant functor. And so that's this is nothing bool. So these two morphisms, is nothing int and is nothing bool, those are the two alphas here, alpha for int and alpha for bool. And, and you can see why we say that the constant functor just ignores its type argument. It doesn't care if you're mapping an int, it's gonna map it to bool. Do you care if you're mapping a bool, it maps to bool too. If you mapped a double, it would map it to bool. If you mapped a, a hash table, it would map it to bool. Um, so this is our constant functor, and uh, and we have these uh, these not components of the natural transformation here, but we have something more than this. Um, we have we have a mapping. Remember uh, uh, of this uh, morphism. This is negative morphism, uh, and you may be excused for asking. Um, okay, I told you before, morphisms, natural transformations map objects onto morphisms. And you can kind of see that there's a morphism for int, there's a morphism for bool here. But I told you that it maps functions, or excuse me, I lapse again, morphisms in C into naturality squares. Where's the square? Well, the square has become, ladies and gentlemen, degenerate. It is degenerated into a triangle. Um, it is, you know, it's bottom, it's bottom, whatever you call it, chord, it's bottom component, it's bottom line got shrunk. And so now it's a triangle. Um, it would go boodle, bull to bull, but we don't draw it as a different object. So, so here we have um, a naturality triangle, which has to be satisfied. If you go around uh, the the two different ways of going from maybe end to bool, you go through is nothing on a maybe end, or you f map is negative um, uh, on that, and and then and then you go uh, and ask is it nothing? You should get the same thing. Um, so you know in this case it's it's basically saying look if it's nothing whatever you map. It's going to yield nothing too, and so of course it's going to be the same same thing. If you if you go around the two sides, um, regardless of how you map it, um, uh, f map these different functions from int to bool. They're all going to preserve nothing as nothing, and things that are not that are not nothing <laughs> elements. You know, some some x is going to be preserved as uh, where x is an int is going to be preserved as some x where x is a bool. Um, so if it's not nothing for maybe event, it's going to be not nothing for maybe a bool, in which case is nothing will yield the same, 
the same thing as it would have for maybe a vent. So going around, this is going to commute and, it, and it, it will commute no matter what function is used here, is negative, is positive, is, is prime, is perfect square, um, is my favorite number. Um, uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to commute. Now, um, you may further be excused for asking, well, okay, that's nice, but we shrank the bottom of the, the square. Um, uh, what happened to that F map of is negative? Well, is negative for the bottom of this square, um, how we go from bool to bool, just turn into this identity morphism. So whatever we answer we get out, it's it's the same same thing. It doesn't doesn't change. If it was to put it another way, if it was if it was nothing for maybe event, it's going to be nothing for maybe a bool. It doesn't change that. Okay, and we could we could say the same thing uh, here for something like count values. If if we had a, a funct if we had a natural transformation that um, uh, that counted the number of values in something. So maybe if it's nothing would be zero. If maybe has an element in it, it will be one. Um, uh, and for list, it would count the length of the list, um, the number of values in the list, zero, if it's empty, one, two, three. Um, we can imagine that as a natural transformation. And it's very similar, right? We, we have maybe event and, and, and constant functor. Um, and uh, and you know either either way we we go about it, it's going to have the same number of elements. And we could have used as a different functor, not maybe event, but list event, and we would have had the same commuting triangle. Because fundamentally, if we have a maybe event, it's going to have the same number of elements. And when it's maybe a bool, that results from lifting some function from int to bool. If we lift a function from int to bool. To apply to a maybe event and get a maybe a bool, it's going to preserve the number of elements. Nothing will still be a nothing. Something that's some, some something will be something a bool. And so the number of elements will be preserved. If this were list instead of maybe, we'd also be preserving it. We're not changing the length of the list by lifting something over it. So that would be natural as well. Um, and I hope you're you're getting a bit of a of a feel for this. Why it it has to be the case um, for for you know how this is is guaranteed. Um, sometimes there are these deep structural similarities between how things are are handled. The semantics of F map don't allow it to change whether or not the maybe held a nothing or an element. It doesn't allow it to change the length of a list. Um, the semantics of F map for, for maybe, um, the semantics of F map for list. Uh, here, we're talking about a similarity between maybe and list for what F map means that guarantees the naturality of, of this square. Um, it guarantees that you go either way, you're gonna get the same thing because that is how fmap is defined. That is what the maybe function, functor, how it operates is in some sense structurally consistent with similar to um, uh, how, how list operates. And it's, it's the same thing here. Any questions on those examples before we go on to some in, inspired by um, monadic uh, natural transformations of great importance in great coming prominence within future sessions of this uh, applied category theory discussion group. Any, any questions on what I've covered before uh, on any of these examples or on the broader motivation and, and context of natural transformations? Questions? told that the rule of thumb 
for remote presentations like this is to wait uncomfortably long to listen for questions. Um, and I'm timing myself by my, my number of bites. Not B-Y-T-E-S, but B-I-T-E-S. Okay, we want to see that dog well fed. Okay. Hearing no no questions, we'll we'll continue here. Um, okay. Um, I asked you to to additionally think about a set of natural transformations, which some of you might have recognized, but not all, as inspired by monadic operations. Okay, um, and. Uh, As we'll see, these operations get to the heart of what it means to be a monad. They have to do with the fact that there's two key natural transformations involved in a monad. And those natural transformations are then involved in, in what are called the monad laws, um, which uh, ensure that a monad is, is genuinely a monad. Uh, now, the two natural transformations have a deeper meaning. And while I may allude to that, um, it will only be in a hand wavy way here. We'll, we'll cover them later. Um, the first of the, the of these um, is, is this natural transformation traditionally called mu. Um, where mu stands for multiply, although I think in German. Um, and this takes a given, in this case, it's a monad uh, as well, um, but you could, it's also a functor, all monads are functors. So it's a functor of a functor. So monad of a monad, list of list of X, and it maps it to a list of X. Um, or it takes a maybe of maybe of X and maps it to a maybe of X. Um, it flattens it. And for lists, this is, is commonly called a flatten. More generally for monads, it's often called join. Um, and it turns out that um, if you think back to our covering coverage of monoids, where a monoid was a single element category where each possible element of, of the monoid um, um, was illustrated with a, with a, a morphism. Right? And we combine these by, by a, with a monoidal operation, in that case by composition, it turns out we're performing a, a monoidal operation here. We're multiplying um, list times list to get a list, okay? So hence the, the mu. Um, but you don't have to really worry about that here. It's just, is this a natural transformation um, uh, is, is the question. Um, well, here, here's our situation, right? Um, so we have some source category C and, and we have these two functors going from C to D. Remember the functors have to go um, um, to the from the same source category, the same target category. Uh, in this case, we really talk about them being endo functors because they are um, they're from Hask into Hask. Um, but conceptually, they could be between categories. Um, so here we have. Um, the first functor, um, list of lists, and and we can have that for ints and for bools. So we have a list of list events, and we over here have list of list of bools. Okay, um, and um, similarly, we have another functor, this one on the right hand side here, list events and list of bools, 
And we want to show that they're in some sense compatible, in some sense consistent um, with a, uh, a natural transformation, um, show that there, there is one. Um, and uh, in this case, because we have these, these reference points, like with Platten, uh, it's not hard to do. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, the way in which we show they're consistent is by showing this mapping between them. Um, and for each object in C, we have this mapping corresponding to that object in C. So for int, we have this mapping, which takes the first functor to the second functor, takes list of list of ints into list of ints. Um, or uh, we have a, a mapping here oh, oh, that takes um, list of list of bools into list of bools. Um, and again, that corresponds to bool over here. Um, this bool got mapped um, um, into, uh, into this morphism. This morphism is labeled by this bool. It has bool's name written on it, okay? Um, and uh, the natural transformation here is going to involve things that, that are lifting. So these two upper and lower sides of the squares um, are going to involve lifting some thing going from int to bool. Um, say it's negative, although it has to hold for all such things. Say is negative again, um, which uh, is going to go from a list of list events uh, to a to a list of bools. Okay, um, and the idea here is we're going to apply this. So if we have a list of list events, we'll go through and we'll apply it to the to you know the the lowest level elements, um, which are kind of two levels down top level of a, a list of a set of lists. And, and each of those lists will have the, the ints in it and we'll apply it to each of those. So fair enough, we could, we, if we have a list of list events, we could apply as negative to each of the ints and get a list of list of bools. Not a lot of mystery there, uh, just a little bit of jiggery pokery. Um, alternatively, and, and, and then by the way, we could flatten it. By flatten it, I mean we kind of we we scrunch it down, we collapse it from a two-level hierarchy to a one-level hierarchy. Um, we just take all those bulls down here um, at the bottom level, and we put them into one big list. We concatenate all the lists in that list of list of ends of bulls into a, a list of bulls. Okay, it's it's all one big list of bulls. Um, just concatenate them in order, um, append them in order. Um, and that's what that flatten does, okay? Uh, we could imagine doing that. Uh, alternatively, we could have flattened it as a list of list of ints up front. We get a big list of ints, and then we could have mapped as negative over those, right? Um, now, uh, and, and I would uh, submit to you I would uh, argue to you that those, either way you go along the top and down the right is gonna yield the same thing as down the left and, and along the bottom. Um, why? Well, because, well, look, flattening is gonna preserve the ordering. We're gonna, it's gonna preserve the number of elements. So for each int down here in list of ints, we're gonna have a, um, you know, we're gonna end up having a, a list of, well, we're gonna have a corresponding bool that just is whether or not it's, it's negative. Um, so if we flatten it as a list of ends, um, it will be the same as, as mapping each of those ends to bools and flattening it as bools. Um, you know, it's half of one, two dozen of the other, um, half, half a dozen of one, um, six of the other, sorry. Um, uh, and um, and in this case, uh, you can go, you know, interchangeably in either. There's a, and uh, you know, lifting this uh, for lists and and for list of lists. Those behave in the same way. Um, they play nicely together. Uh, listed list events. The way in which it lifts is negative to apply on each of the operations, 
um, when you then flatten it, it's going to give the same thing as as you know flattening it first and and then doing um, and then lifting it to list. Those two are, are fully consistent with their operations. So this is a natural transformation, um, and it's a very important one. It's it's one that's central to list uh, as uh, um, um, as a um, as a monad. Um, List is, is a beautiful thing. Um, list will come out in a lot of examples because list is a monoid as well. Um, it's associative. When you append two lists, it's associative. If you append list, you know, L1, L2, and L3, um, you can do L1, L, append L2, and then L3, or you can do L1, append the appending of, of L2 and L3, and, and it will the append the appending of those yeah and it will it will yield the same thing um it's a monoid and it turns out to actually correspond to a free monoid um but we'll we'll get to that another time um uh it's it's kind of a representative of, of free monoids okay um okay so um but it, it's also a, a monad um which is a monoid in the category of endofunctors, but um, we get ahead of ourselves. Okay, um, so list, um, list a list of ends to list, this collapsing, this monoidal multiplication, you can think of it, um, is a natural transformation. It's an important one. And the same thing occurs with maybe, right? Um, if we have a maybe of maybe events, we can kind of join it to get a maybe event. So what would this mean if you know, maybe if maybe if okay we can yeah, so it's it's clear to all of us what maybe event means i mean we may have an enter we may not but if i have a maybe of a maybe events well maybe i i don't even have a maybe event maybe i just have nothing right I have nothing at all um or i could i could have a maybe event but it's also nothing um either way i it's nothing I don't have nothing, um, uh, or or I have a value. Um, so, either way you go, whether it's a whether it's a nothing on the outside or a nothing on the inside, the result is not a. I, I don't. I ain't got nothing. I, it's it's there's nothing there. Okay. Um, it's only if you have something in that inner maybe that you have something. And this join basically collapses that. So it collapses a maybe of maybe events into a, it's either nothing or it's it's um, or it or it's the end that you got the sum sum end. Okay, um, uh, and and that that can hold true for for bulls as well. So that's what join event does. That's what join a bull does. And look, if I have this is negative, and if I apply it to this maybe of maybe, if it's nothing on the outside, it's nothing. If it's nothing on the inside, it's nothing. If it's an int on the inside, I'll, I'll, I'll apply as negative and get a bool and get a maybe of maybe a bool. Yeah, that works. Um, whoa, um, mumble, mumble, mumble. Um, okay, so um, alternative, and, and then I can do join um, um, on that and collapse those two nothings down to be a single possible nothing or a bool. And I should get the same thing as if I had a maybe of maybe event and I collapsed it down to a just a plain maybe event and I ask, and I lift is negative to operate on that. If it's nothing, you got nothing. If it's if it's an end, oh, excuse me, if, yes, if it's an end, I, I get um, a bool. Um, either way you go should, yield the, the same thing because mapping it is kind of preserving this, the, the fundamental structural uh, integrity of, of what a maybe of maybe does in a way that's consistent with a maybe. Um, nothings are nothings and, um, and uh, you know, values uh, just have, the, have this applied to them. And the resulting semantics of this are consistent with just having it for a maybe. It, it yields the same result because because all you need all you need is one nothing. You don't need these 
outer and inner layers. And, and really, in a way, that's what this is saying, this natural transformation. You don't need all that sound and fury um, uh, to, to signify this, this smaller thing. So this square commutes um, for maybe of maybe event. Um, and it's because of, of the fundamental semantics being, being captured uh, here. Now, these two later ones, these were mu for multiply. We're kind of multiplying maybe a maybe to get a maybe or list and list and to get list. That will be actually very important later for monads. Um, join is one of the, the you, you can kind of canonicalize monads in a, in a couple different ways. And one of them that's, that's enjoyed by category theorists and I, and um, in which I think has a lot to recommend it is with uh, join being one of the, uh, the two important operations. Um, the other is called uh, ADA and it's, it goes by the name uh, unit um, uh, or return um, in, a, in a programming context or pure. Um, and, um, and we'll see it again um, when we look at monads and particularly how they emerge from adjunctions. Um, every adjunction gives rise to a monad and a comonad. And for the monad, we have an eta, that's this Greek letter up here. And for the comonad, we have uh, in uh, we have a uh, epsilon, um, which is corresponds to extract on the on the programming level. Okay, um, so. So let's let's think about this one, right? We're, here we have the identity functor. Before we saw the constant functor, and identity functor is another kind of of these these kind of unusual but important beasts that I introduced in that lecture on special citizens of the functor kingdom. Um, some some lecture or some lectures ago, meetings ago. Um, so the identity functor. Um, uh, just uh, maps, um, uh, mumble, uh, yeah, the, the identity functor um, uh, is, is something that simply maps um, when, when we, so it's a functor from C to D, and it maps each object over here in C to the same, same object uh, in C, which is written as D here, but again, I said this is really mapping back to C. It just gets very visually confusing if you show it. It's an endo functor. It maps from has to hask. So int is mapped to int. Bool is mapped to bool by the identity functor. That's different from the constant functor, which mapped int and bool both here to int, right? Or or to bool, to a, to a particular, 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 um, uh, object in the target. Here we're mapping each of these to itself. Okay, identity functor is an endo functor uh, of necessity. It maps that object, uh, a given object, onto itself. Um, so ints go to ints, bools go to bools, um, and um, not surprisingly, a given function. Well, this is a function, but it's a given morphism between. Um, those two objects goes to the same morphism. That's what the identity functor does. It preserves objects and it preserves morphisms. Okay, um, so here we go. Now here's the identity functor up top. That's the top level of this. The bottom level uh, is for the list um, because we're going from ID of X to list of X. Um, so this is list down here. Um, we have the list functor mapping ints to list of ints and bools to list of bools. Um, and we know how that functor operates. It's one of our friends. And we know that for is negative, it will just lift it to operate on lists. Familiar mapping, as we call it, uh, it maps it um, for lists. We, we often just say map. We don't have to say F map, even though it, it is F map. Uh, it's, um, it is a time honored name as map as well. 
for lists particular. Totally just map is negative, okay? Um, that's the bottom of our naturality square. And the question is, is it natural? Does it commute? Um, okay. So remember the functor here mapped, um, or excuse me, the natural transformation mapped uh, each object over here into a morphism. So this is the morphism corresponding to int. And it tells us how to go from how the first functor mapped it, which is to itself, and to uh, the second functor mapped it, list. And this is a corresponding morphism for this other object. And, um, and each morphism here is, is this commuting square. So this is for is negative. Um, OK. Um, so we have here, uh, we have to consider if we go from int, need to go from int to a list of bools. Oh, boy. Um, um, is it really the same either way? Well, let, 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 let's let's think about this. Um, OK, so suppose we were to first ask, OK, we have this int, and we apply is negative to it, and we get a bool. OK, that's not too bad, right? We get a bool, it tells us if the int were negative or positive. And, and then we go with this natural transformation um, that this natural transformation mapping from ID of X to list of X, whose job in life is just to insert, after all, we need to go from a bool to a list of bools. And what's the obvious thing? Well, all we have is one element. We have, we have one stinking bool. What do we do with it? What do I do with my stinking bull? I, I put it into a list. How can I put it into a list? Well, it's just a singleton list. That's all. I just create a singleton list with that one bull in it, right? Um, that ain't too bad. Um, so I get a singleton list of this bull. And what does that bull tell me? It tells me whether that int was, was negative or not, right? Um, that original int. So this is kind of a a fancy way to go through and get a singleton list telling me this this int you gave me a singleton list of bools that tells me whether this int you gave me was negative or positive okay a little bit contrived but but okay but now let's consider the other way the alternative is we could take that end and uh we could put it into a list of ends a singleton list of ends okay so it's just a a singleton in there. That's all we can do with the end. Where else am I going to put it? I'm going to, yeah, okay, sure. I'll stick it, stick it in this, this, this list, right? Um, um, and suppose then I were to, to uh, map over that list is negative. Um, well, it's going to make this end. It's the only thing in it, and I map is negative over. It's going to give me a a list of bulls, because I have a list of events that can give me a list of bulls. And the, the only bull in that list is going to be the one that results from asking is negative the only int in that list over, oh, over over here, which is the only one that came from there. So yeah, of course, it's got to commute. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's this original int. It just pops up here, and it's classified down here, or it's classified up here, and we stick it in the list. Either way, we got to get the same thing out. I mean, it should be fairly obvious to you. Now, mind you, this this is this is a reflection of the fact we we were savvy here in choosing the right components of this natural, um, uh, uh, you know, this natural transformation, right? Um, and uh, if we had chosen, tried to choose different components of it. Um, maybe this one on the left, mapping from int to list of int. This is just one of many functions that can go from int to list events. Maybe we'll leave this one as it is, but this one on the right for bulls, we'll, we'll say, oh, we'll special case it for bulls. And for bulls, it will insert three elements, um, three, you know, if we get a given bool, true. 
we'll insert, we'll create a list with three trues in a, in a row, a list of length three. Well, that would be pretty funky, right? It, it just wouldn't be consistent. Um, that wouldn't be a valid natural transformation. Um, um, so um, so that, that would be problematic as a natural transformation. Um, and, uh, and so you see, the, the fact that this is a natural transformation came about by choosing um, consistent mappings here. Is this the only natural transformation between these? Um, could there be other natural transformations that would also, um, uh, also you know, make this natural? Well, I put that out to the uh, to the assembled people here. Um, could you imagine a different function here, um, uh, other than the the singleton one? The one that makes an infinite list. Sorry. The one that makes an infinite list. Yeah, Same you thing? could make an infinite list. That's right. Yeah, um, that would be that would be consistent, right? Um, and that would that that would allow this to commute for is negative. Um, now uh, there's a question: Is there a whole family of these? You know, um, if we pick the one, for example, which had three, it inserted three of them um, or two of them. Um, would that be consistent? Um, for all possible f's uh, is negative, um, you know, is positive, is prime, you know, all different ways of going from ints to bools, would that still be consistent? Um, it, it's not obvious to me that it wouldn't be. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to think about. I haven't thought about it till now, but I, I think actually it would probably work it's yeah. just uh, with monads, this is um, going to be a very, a very uh, particular uh, one that's involved for a specific monad. I think, I think actually there, there could be a, a whole family of, of possible natural transformations that would be internally consistent. Um, if, con if someone could come up with a, a counterexample, of, for example, why duplicating it three times instead of one time wouldn't work, um, I'd welcome um, I'd welcome, you know, a demonstration. Um, but um, with the list monad, it's going to be a single one. You're going to you're going to put it in there once. There's some monad laws that also have to apply, in which which don't rule out it. And, and here we we don't have those that extra structure of the monad laws. So we could do it. I think we could get a valid natural transformation with creating something other than the singleton list. And, and the um, certainly the infinite list would be an example. Um, uh, okay, so similarly with, with maybe, um, uh, here, here we have identity functor up here. This is eta for maybe. This is, um, so this is the maybe functor level. This is the identity functor level. And we've got these natural transformations between them. Um, which simply insert into the maybe with some S O M E. Um, so, you know, we, we, uh, if we start with an int and we want a maybe a bool, we can either apply is negative and we have a given function here is negative. We can either apply that function to get a bool and then put it into the maybe, or we can say, we'll start with a maybe event and we'll lift that function to operate on the maybe. This is safe because that's how, list, that's how lifting a function to operate on a maybe is defined. It's, it's, it's got to yield the same thing. It has to yield the same thing structurally. It's, um, it's the same basic deal because of how this is defined, okay? Um, um, this this lifting. Um, okay, um, I want to talk about some non-examples. Um, I had hoped to have some um, 
some um, diagrams for some of these. Um, but um, the first of them I've already harped on a little bit, which is with ad hoc polymorphism. Um, so all this breaks down um, if you start to have ad hoc polymorphism. So what's allowed this to work is, you know, we have the same, say, flatten here or the same join here um, in place, regardless of this type here. Um, uh, and um, sorry, <laughs> my wife was trying to take my breakfast. Um, uh, and um, I, I'm desirous of finishing it at some point. Um, so uh, uh, here we we have um, we have basically the, the same rule applying join for bools and join for ints. If you started to to have you know a different wacko rule for one of those, you know maybe you say for bools we'll define the mapping of maybe to maybe a bool to maybe a bool differently. You know if um, um, something if it has an, um, an inner, uh, you know, if, if it has an outer nothing, we will consider it sum of minus one, um, S-O-M-E of minus one, um, uh, when, we, when we collapse it down to maybe a bool. Um, but if it has an inner nothing, we'll make it nothing. Um, if you had some whacked out rule like that, um, that applies for one of the types, but not for others. Um, you're not going to get. You're not going to be guaranteed to get a natural transformation out. Um, but uh, here, uh, within within the context of Haskell, if you have something that's defined with parametric polymorphism and not ad hoc polymorphism this theorems for free results um, stays true and you're guaranteed to have this uh, this commute which is you know utterly striking for reasons we'll come back to in a in a few minutes if you start to think about how constrained these these are i've tried to motivate like why it makes sense that there's that, that it's natural that you just want it to be the case that this is the case it, it's and it and why it works so nicely with programming, but it's a very strong result that we can depend on it. I mean, that's that's really um, desirable. The, the example that I gave you though was representation size, and this this gets into this issue of kind of ad hoc versus rule based polymorphism. And the idea here was, look, um, suppose we map a maybe of x into a constant functor on int. Um, so it might be something like this, um, but instead of is nothing, it's is represent, excuse me, uh, this one, uh, is representation size instead of count values. Count values is, is notable because um, no matter what type uh, our values are being summarized in the maybe, or if this were an int, um, or sorry, a list, um, no matter, what what type of of elements you have, whether they're ints or bools or doubles or whatever, the count of values is going to be the same, um, and um, and so you get this nice uh, commuting of this. If it's representation size instead of count values, you're no longer going to have that nice property because if you map say using is negative, something that's, uh, let's say a, a list of int, and we have a certain representation size that encodes the fact that ints are, you know, four bytes in size or whatever, um, B-Y-T-E-S, I might add. Um, um, then, then um, and you map it using is negative, that's gonna change the representation size, right? Um, and uh, and so the um, the resulting list of bool or or maybe a bool is going to be of different 
different size. And if you then take representation size of that, it's going to be different than if you would take the representation size of list events um, and then mapped, you know, done an identity transformation from int to int to get the result. That's going along the, the other two sides of the, of the square. Um, remember, the square has been collapsed at the bottom. But, uh, you know, really, one's one going along um, uh, one uh, way from maybe event to end will be this way, this way. The other is to go this way and then around via this uh, dotted line, which I, I put it dotted because normally we don't draw it. It's the identity, um, the identity on ints. Here, that's fine because because the count values is the same and identity on ints leaves it the same. And so we're hunky dory. But if this were representation size, we couldn't map it just to identity anymore. Um, because that would suggest the representation size of maybe event is the same as the representation size of um, maybe a bool, which it's not. Now, if it were mapped, not with a constant functor, but another functor that mapped here, um, it to a, a function that, you know, when it essentially it, it changes the value. It's not the identity function on ints, but rather if you have a, if you map is negative on ints here, it will change it from being, you know, it, it, if let's suppose um, uh, ints are of size four. And let's suppose booleans are of size one byte, one by, four bytes versus one byte. Um, it would divide the representation size by four as a result. So it divides the int by four. Um, uh, what you get uh, going going this way, it just divides it by four. Now that actually, I think, would would actually allow the square to commute um, and uh, you could imagine generalizing that to not only in symbols, but, but other things. And so there you could get, I think, a natural transformation, but it wouldn't be with the constant functor. So this is not, this is not a natural transformation, but I do think it could work if you were to map to a morphism of integer values uh, around, around int. Any comments on that one? That one I thought was an interesting one to think about. Or could we go back to the example of the list of list of ints? Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering, in the context of this example, if flat map could be considered a composition of F map and flatten, and would it then be a natural transformation? <laughs> Right. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Or am flat, I mixing up my terms with with well, morphisms? Flat flat map. Um, I'm, I'm having a a sudden brain seizure here, but um, flat map I think is going to. Um, it's going to essentially compose those is my recollection. Um, um, yeah. And flat map is equivalent to bind, Haskell's bind. Yeah. Um, so, so it's going to uh, allow for, um, for taking in something that uh, is going to be a monad um, here. Uh, a list, um, uh, or, or in this case, a, a list of of lists. I think you're you're dealing with uh, up here, and uh, apply this this function uh, to it, and uh, and and get back uh, a, a list of of lists. So, 
I, th I think that's going to be basically the same, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very successful in grappling with this right now. But, um, but uh, I, I think that would allow you to, to essentially implement this, uh, this mapping on list of lists. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So something I, I wanted to emphasize though, um, in our, in our um, final minutes here was, um, uh, was were the constraints here. And, and for this, I'm, I'm going to need to actually create a diagram uh, inspired by uh, Bartosh's uh, which um, is going to be um, representing um, sort of uh, constrained nature of um, uh, these, these things shouldn't uh, be going here. Sorry, I need to, uh, uh, I need to probably put this. Okay, okay, uh, mumble. Um, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I, I would like to put this in a much better place. Um, okay, uh, give me just a second. Um, so recent dogs, yeah, but where do those live? Um, I won't futz with this for any more than a minute longer. Um, I've taught a lot of classes in my time. Um, uh, do, 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 uh, yeah, 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 uh, diagrams. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a uh, constrained nature of, uh, uh, of natural transformations. Um, and actually I can, I can gain a little bit of time by loading in this one and and riffing off of it okay um so i'm going to uh go and map this boom yeah um okay here we are um so this is this illustrates the basic uh, the basic elements of uh, uh of, of a natural transformation and what I'd like to do here is to uh, just think a little bit about uh, harking back to some of Bar the points Bartosh made uh, during his lecture. Think a little bit about what this means um, in terms of the um, uh, the specificity of alpha A and alpha B. I mean, how tight a constraint is it? It turns out that this will come up uh, later um in some of our examples and i think particularly in the context of the UNA dilemma uh but what bartosh had um alluded to was the fact that um if we think about f of a for example f of b and uh, g of b and g of a as sets we, we, we apply this in many other categories besides set, but sets are of particular interest because they're directly relevant for, for understanding and hast. Um, so if we think of, of each of these objects uh, in this, um, uh, in this uh, triangle as a set, um, we will get something uh, along these lines and um, I'm going to draw each of these objects as a set, and I'm going to violate, as Bartosz did, kind of the, the, the perspective, do injustice to the perspective of category theory in not looking inside of sets, okay? Um, we, we, we generally try to avoid um, sort of thinking about elements of sets uh, when we're dealing with, with category theory, but I, I Hope you'll. I actually find it quite helpful sometimes to to orient myself to what's going on categorically. To sometime hark back to the example of set and think through what this really means for elements of sets um, 
it, it can be um, uh, kind of grounding in some cases, as long as you don't get too caught up in it. So if we think of, um, of this situation here and we, um, uh, we think of F of A here, so this is F A, um, this is F B, uh, this is uh, G A, and this is G B. And we, we think of them as, as sets uh, of, of dots, right? Um, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in uh, some scattered dots here, okay? Um, we might have, for example, FF mapping a given element over here into a corresponding element in FB. And, um, and that's mapped by, by FF here. So I'll, I'll go back to the to kind of uh, finer grain thing and we'll say this is, you know, FF. Whoa, um, probably I should have or should write it in the same color as it is written up there. So this is, uh, oh, oh, it is black. Okay, I'm sorry. I mistook that. Okay, here we go. So this is uh, F, F, F. That's going between FA and FB, right? Um, and then we have alpha B um, down here, which is shown in blue. So I'll try to be consistent with that. There we go. Um, this is alpha B. Cool. And over here is alpha A. Uh, cool. There we go. And um, and then we have another um, uh, GF here. And what I'm going to do is 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 generalize this a little bit by talking about um, more than just um, excuse me. I, I mislabeled that last one. Um, and in fact, I'm going to draw it. Uh, with malice of forethought uh, directly into there. And in fact, I'm going to draw this one similarly into uh, as occurring uh, for, for sort of a subset. Oh, excuse me. No, it has to handle everything in FA. So um, this is going to come from here, but it may map to a, it may not be surjective, it may map to a sort of certain subset of this, okay? Um, and uh, alpha B is going to need to map anything anywhere in FB um, into a, what could be a certain subset here within, uh, within GB. So I'm going to, to update this by, by color. Um, so that we can show, whoa, whoa, why didn't that catch that color? Oh, come on. Um, okay, um, there we go. And we will just clean this up, okay. Um, and there we go. Okay, uh, oh, I went back, come on, come on, okay, cool. Okay, so um, the point is these mappings are functions here because we're in set. So this is you know set over here, um, and and they may not always be surjective. So it has to map anything in the source into something that that may or may not um, be the complete uh, complete set here, um, and and so this uh, this green element which started up here at FA, if we kind of look at where its, its image goes, its successive um, mapping, uh, it may end up here, right? Through FF and then alpha B. Um, and, uh, and similarly, um, it has to go to the exact same place down there when mapped with alpha A. So with alpha A, it may get mapped to um, something up uh, up uh, here, for example, and I'm going to uh, just illustrate that that could be in a subset of this mapped to by uh, by alpha a, for example, um, and then uh, 
GB is going to need to um, to map the entirety of, of GA over into um, some set. So what what naturality is telling us here is that the, the success of mapping of a given element from FA, because because if you go around the um, uh, this naturality square either way, it has to be the same function. What that means is, and that function is going from this set ultimately up here in uh, FA, for each and every element of it, it has to match where it gets mapped to in GB. If it's the same function, if, uh, if going around the, the top and right of that, um, that naturality square yields uh, this, uh, this green one to go down to this one uh, in, in GB, then the same thing has to be true when it goes down with alpha A and over uh, along the, the bottom with, uh, with GF here, okay? So I'm just gonna say uh, GF. So that's our reminder that this is, uh, this is that mapping. Uh, now, similarly, um, uh, if we add a, a red one, you know, it would need to, it would need to be mapped um, to, to similar places here and similar places uh, here. Um, okay, so, so we need, you know, we need, either way we go about it, we need to get them mapped to the same final, um, final point. Now, you know, one of the things Bartosz commented is, um, this doesn't totally constrain alpha B uh, based on alpha A. If we consider what alpha A does, for example, um, alpha B may have some latitude, for example, in, in mapping some items out, out here. Um, so for example, we might have uh, an item out here and alpha B wouldn't have its, um, uh, have its uh, con it have constraints imposed by where by how alpha a mapped uh, this blue thing because uh, it, uh, it it isn't something that is mapped to from fa and that's true for a given ff but if we consider the fact that different fun uh, different um, uh, morphisms over here Let's say, let's suppose a morphism, you know, G. Uh, it also needs to have a, a naturality square. And we, we, we showed it earlier, right? That it induces a naturality square of its own. Um, and uh, this is, of course, FG. Um, and this is uh, GG. So we need the same alpha A and alpha B to remain in place for those. Um, so whatever alpha A and alpha B are, you know, their hands are tied. Um, whatever they are has to be able to handle not just FF, but also, you know, uh, not just uh, F, but it has to also be able to handle G and any other number of functions. So if we consider, for example, um, uh, where we might map uh, using, uh, you know, F, uh, FG here. Maybe we map to a somewhat uh, disjoint uh, component here. And to make the point a little bit more clear, what I'm going to do is to, to just show it as including that, um, uh, that uh, element uh, up here. And I will fix this up to, to include that, okay. And so now alpha B um, for, with, respect to G, with respect to F, alpha B didn't have a constraint as to how it mapped Mr. Blue here. But with respect to um, uh, F of G, this, this new morphism we're considering, because this has to be a natural transformation that holds for all morphisms over here um, of whatever provenance, um, all these different morphisms, um, we have actually many constraints uh, imposed on alpha A and alpha B 
in order for them to be to guarantee the naturality condition across all of those different morphisms over here in C. Um, we need alpha A, A and alpha B to be, you know, awfully um, strict about how they map things in order to guarantee this, this consistency. Um, and uh, so for example, this, uh, this one here, we, we have a labeling of this as FG. We're going to have uh, a, a similar thing down here. Um, so alpha B might map uh, that just to, to illustrate that onto, you know, this uh, this component, um, and now if we consider where uh, you know where we've mapped uh, that uh, that uh, element uh, with respect to here, with respect to no, I, I'm getting I have to be cautious here because it may be that this blue is just the image of the red, so I'm gonna. I'm going to show it as as sort of being mapped, mapping the this red one uh, with FG into that, whereas the red one was mapped with FF into into red. It's mapped here with blue, and uh, alpha B maps it um, via alpha B down to whoop, uh, down to this one at the bottom um, there. Okay. So that's all alpha B's maps. And, uh, you know, for, for that, for G, if we consider capital G here, um, you know, capital G, G, it needs to map, um, to, to map that blue over to that exact uh, same point. So um, it's going to map uh, alpha A is going to map this red one down to the red one, and uh, with with uh, GG here, it has to map it. Um, and I should probably show that in in black instead of uh, in, instead of the uh, that same color, or show it in in light blue, um, which is confusing things a little bit. I'll have to to neaten this up, but um, this is GG. So the point is, the the naturality condition needs to hold across all different of these of these morphisms in C. And it is true that alpha B for a given morphism F has some latitude because it it doesn't need to worry about anything outside of say this black box up here in in FG, but once we consider different morphisms, F, G, H, et cetera, those might have different images in FB, which indeed have to be mapped consistently um, through alpha B in a way that's consistent with how they're mapped by um, alpha A here and then uh, GG. So in short, there's a pretty stiff constraint here on um, alpha B in terms of what alpha A does. And these have to be quite, um, um, quite sort of uh, judiciously chosen in order to have a, a consistency in handling all of the different Fs, Gs, Hs that can be in C. And that's what we saw, you know, informally in our example. Uh, again, I'll have to uh, fix up those colors. But when we were looking earlier here in these examples, you know, it was it 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 wasn't an accident that we were able to pull out a natural transformation here that mapped all these. The fact that we had a natural transformation that worked between these functors, maybe and maybe versus maybe, or list and list in, in terms of list, or maybe an int, or maybe, uh, or maybe in list. This wasn't an accident. The fact that there was a natural transformation that could thread that needle, that could 
that that had the requisite discipline to map things in the right way that would handle all possible morphisms here within C. Not just is negative, but is positive, is non-negative, is is you know uh, is perfect square, all those sorts of things. Um, that actually was made possible because of the functors involved, maybe in list being so similar. So naturality is a strong condition. It's a condition which as the number of morphisms multiply in C, um, it gives us a bit more latitude in what morphisms we choose but to use between the functors, but it ties our hands in terms of needing to, to simultaneously match all these naturality squares. And really the only way we're gonna do it in many cases is if the two functors involved are in some sense similar. They, they handle things in ways that are consistent. That doesn't mean, again, they're the same. Maybe is different than list. List is different than maybe. Um, they can collapse things in some cases, as we see here for is nothing or count values. That's fine. One functor can collapse things where the other doesn't, but they have to be consistent with each other. They have to model C, category C and category D in a way that uh, is in some sense jibes with each other or is consistent. Um, and this issue of mutual consistency is more, is a deeper issue. We're seeing it here in a directed way. You know, could morphism F um, uh, have a natural transformation to G? We're now going to be transitioning starting next time to adjunctions. And adjunctions give us this extra level of power where they allow us to, to reason about this reciprocally and um, in a way that's mutual, where we have F and G and we talk about them being consistent with each other um, in ways that, uh, that guarantee certain structural preservation. And natural transformations will be at the heart and center of it. So what you've learned now caps you know these these three fundamental concepts and you're you're moving now to the status of a journey person um who uh who has you know a knowledge of categories functors and natural transformations enough that you can now uh engage uh in in a wide variety of of uh really interesting applications of category theories and natural trans and excuse me adjunctions will be the first we'll be turning to and it's very interesting because we'll have these categories that are similar to one another as captured by functors each way that play nicely together that are consistent with kind of how they treat the situation such that one category is not an, a mirror of the other exactly typically but they have a, an overall similarity that is, um, uh, that is uh, consistent uh, between them. And we will, uh, we will see then how adjunctions um, end up providing a basis for understanding monads um, because uh, every adjunction does, does uh, produce a monad. Um, and uh, every monad is is produced by by uh, at least uh, one or more adjunctions, um, and uh, therefore they're going to provide a gateway to monads as well. Uh, adjunctions also provide uh, some fascinating opportunities within the modeling space. But I've spoken enough. Uh, I thank you for your patience. I'll work on cleaning up that last diagram, which was uh, fairly uh, ad hoc and spontaneous. I apologize if it didn't communicate all the concepts involved with complete clarity. Uh, but I hope that this lecture has given you some sense of sort of intuition behind natural transformations, some sense as to why they hold in programming in a commonsensical way 
but at, at the same time, some sense as to why they're special quantities and why when an astral transformation holds, it's not just a curious beast that we're able to create, but it rather tells us something deeper that, about the functors involved for which it, it provides this transformation, between which it provides this transformation, between which it provides this mapping. A natural, the existence of a natural transformation, um, it, it doesn't merely whisper to us. It positively speaks to us or yells at us that the two functors have this structural relationship at a deeper level that, um, uh, that uh, can allow us to reason about their, their joint action in a, um, a deeper level than we might otherwise would have realized. So it speaks about their, their underlying similarities and how they work, how they're defined, how FMAP is defined for them and in programming terms. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, next time we'll, we'll go on to adjunctions, um, but uh, you're to be congratulated for um, persisting thus far because uh, if you're feeling some degree of, uh, if not comfort, uh, um, non uh, flum being non-flamuxed by natural transformations, you're putting yourself in extremely good sta uh, stead for the, uh, the next stage of our work where we'll build on all these concepts uh, with concepts like that junctions, monads, algebraic data types, and uh, those are all tied in with these three big concepts we've uh, traversed. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, you can go reward yourselves if you'd like to with uh, uh, as you uh, see fit. And I'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nate. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.